Hello, this is Larry Hedrick with Mysteries of the Superstition Mountain, where we bring the past into the present for you and our future viewers. Today we have a story by Jack San Felice. Wow, the first Dutch hunters. You see, all the stories and different things that were written over the years are confusing. Confusing to me because the clues are different, they keep changing, and you wonder what, where the truth comes out of this thing. So I decided to discard most of those modern theories and clues and went back to the original source. What was the original source? Who was there when the Dutchman was given the clues? Julia Thomas, also called Helena. And sometimes the, the Dutchman called her Helena. And that was Jacob Waltz. And then Riney Patrash was there. And that was before the flood of 1891. Well, the search for clues by many people over the years has caused a lot of um, inaccurate statements being made. So I go back and I'm digging in through my files and I try to come up with the best possible information. The best possible information is usually the first story. And this is the first story, and a lot of it is about Herman Patrash and what happened to him after the Dutchman story. Okay, here we go with the Dutchman story himself. Jacob Waltz lived on 160 acres at one time near Phoenix, the, the city that became Phoenix. And during that time, um, he, he grew things and he was a little bit of a farmer and uh, he sold some produce. He had some people working for him. But during the winter months, he went out into the Superstition Mountains. And it seems like every time he went out there, he came back with some gold nuggets. As we progress, we're talking about the Thomas store. That's Julia Thomas and her husband, Emil Thomas. Now, during this period, just before the great flood of 91, Emil Thomas runs off with a 17-year-old girl. He abandons his wife. And she goes to start doing, taking over the business. She finds out that Emil had bought an Arctic soda fountain. Cost $2,000. Paid, no. It, it was an unpaid bill. And she goes through the collection of, of bills and things, what she has to do. She doesn't have the money to pay for it. Like she's been abandoned by her husband and he, he left her with all these bills. And this happens today. It's not unusual. One spouse leaves the other, et cetera, et cetera. So she, she had been friends with Jacob Waltz for a few years. And she knows Jacob had some money. So she goes up to old Jake and she starts crying. She says, Jake, he, Emil left me with all these bills. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I can't do it. I just can't do it. And now they were friends. And there was a small collection of Germans that, that hovered around that bakery shop. And one of them, of course, was Jake Waltz. And Riney, who worked for Julia or Helena Thomas. The Dutchman called her Helena, and everybody else referred to her as Julia. That's before the flood. The flood washed his house away in 91. So he's living in the house now. And he says to her, he marks off from the front door. He takes several steps, and he puts a little X on the ground, and he says, now go get that pick and dig this hole right here. It was an unpaved, it wasn't a finished floor. Most people back in the 1800s had dirt floors. So Julia goes over and she digs up an oyster can. People think that that was uncommon. No, it wasn't. Because Julia and um, Emil had also run an oyster bar. And oysters were shipped constantly to them in cans. And canned oysters would stay through the heat. And so that, that was one of the nuances of 
her bakery, and it's even in the advertisements. So he goes to the, he goes and picks up this can, and he opens it up, and he checks it, he says, okay, take this can and use it to pay about 100, 800 of your bills. About $800, I think, is in this one. And she says, oh, Jake, I can't take your money, all your money. He said, don't worry about it. I've got 50 more of these cans buried around the place. If you look, if that was 800 to 1,000, you figure 50 cans, so you have got 40 or $50,000. Then, at that money, what would that be today? That was a, that exclamation would be a lot of money. It's probably about 20 times that in the price of gold. So probably about $800,000 maybe. So here we go. So Jake, he has no problem. He said, and she says, but what if someone comes looking for that? They see that. He said, don't worry about it. He said, he said, I've got them buried all over the place. And only I know where they are. And so he could have on 160 acres, could have put them all in one corner. He could have put them at the four corners of his property, anywhere, anywhere. And he could have also put him between his house somewhere in the Superstition Mountains. That's where he got his gold. So Jake said, it's okay. Don't worry about it. He says, you go down and pay your little bills off with this, and I'll get some more, and I'll we'll come down to your bakery, go over your bills, and then we'll take care of it. Well, as I said, the Arctic soda fountain was $2,000. And when he uh, totaled up the rest of the bills, it was about $4,000 in bills that were outstanding. And, and she still had to buy supplies to keep the bakery going. So, so she does. Jake gives her the money, it's gone. So he said, Julia, why, or Elena, why do you work so hard? You don't need to do that. He says, I have plenty of money and I have a gold mine in the mountains. And if you would just let me take you out there, you could get enough money, you would never have to work again. Well, while this conversation is going on and she doesn't know really what, what it is. So she goes back to work and time goes by. And during the first part of 1891, there was a major flood in Phoenix. And in this flood, it washed away Jake's adobe house. Jake gets caught in the flood and storm up in a tree, and he gets sick, very sick, and he becomes pneumonia. He's up there for three days. There's a lot of different stories as to who got him, but the main part is he got very sick. And Julia said, he. Hey, she owes all, him all that money. So she said, I'll take care of you. Come on. To, and she takes him over to her house. And she gives him a place to live out back, which is right next to the main house, right attached to it. So that's, that's that story. And while Jake is there, he's telling Riney and her in German, he's telling you, he has the gold. I said, that. He's speaking in Deutsch, Deutschland, or uh, German, as the people from Germany were called, Deutschmen. And that's how the, actually the name um, was Americanized from Deutschmen to Dutchman. And that's, what, that's how the Dutchman got his name, a little side part there. So during the many, many months that he's sick, he's giving them information on where this mine is in the Superstition Mountains. In the Superstition Mountains. Not out at the west side or the north side, or whatever, but in the Superstition Mountains, he says. And he, at, at different times, he says to Reine, in German, Reine, you're not paying attention. He says, you must take down notes. So Reine lacked luster on paying attention and taking the notes. So Jake decides he's going to leave, some, he's going to write some notes down in German. So while he's talking, he's writing notes down. And that, and he also leaves, a, puts a map in there. And this is all collected. 
Well, in October of um, 1891, the Dutchman gets real sick. And he's had these bouts come and go, come and go, and he gets real sick. And Julia, or Helena, thinks he's going to die. So she, her and Riney went for the doctor. And some other people come in. And then there's, there's a story about gold under the Dutchman's bed and who got the gold and a civil court case. And that, that's a big story by itself. And that'll be the Holmes story versus the Patrashes and Julia Thomas and a court case. Well, in any event, the Dutchman passes away October 25th, 1891. Julia believes so strong that the mine is out there. She has seen the gold. He's given her so enough gold to pay off 4,000 debt worth of debts. And he says, well, he's had 50 cans just buried around. And that much gold was, it was, you know, tempting. And so she became so enthused over this. She had the Dutchman's clues to his mind, and she had the math. So, so she decides to sell her store, her bakery, and get ready to go into the mountains. And what happened was neither Julia nor Riney were miners, and they didn't trust any other people to do this with them. So they contacted... Um, Riney's brother, Herman, now that enter Herman into the fray. And so they contacted Herman and Herman, Herman and Riney's father, Gottfried, and that they're out of town and it's winter time. You can't travel in the mountains in the winter. So by spring, they're making their way from the north down to Phoenix and they don't, get in, they don't get into Phoenix until summertime. And they don't get organized to go out into the mountains until August of 1892. August, August, think about it, you Phoenicians. <laughs> hot, fry an egg on a sidewalk type of hot. So, so uh, Julia takes her money and they, from selling the store, and they get supplied, they get a wagon, and they go out to the west end of the Superstition Mountains. The west end. No gold on the west end. The gold is across the street in Goldfield, but it's not been discovered yet in, in large supply. It's been discovered, but just little minor amount. So they go there, and then they go to, um, into the mountains. They, they try to follow the clues that are written in German, by the way. And they're following the clues. They're following the map. And what has happened is they're having a conflict between all of them. Enter the, enter the picture, Jim Bark. Jim Bark bought the cattle ranch, the first cattle ranch in the Superstitions, which was owned by Matt Cavanus. He raised cows there. And so Jim Bark buys that, and eventually it becomes the world-famous Quarter Circle U Ranch, or the U Ranch. But Jim Bark is a cattleman, so he's raising cattle. And he, while he's out there, he sees this group of people in August, and he invites them to his house. It's in the evening. He says, come to the house. We've already eaten. He said, but the fire's still going. There's plenty of food. You cook your own meal. And while they're, while they're there, they're, they are sharing their story of why they're in the mountains. He said, I've seen you for quite some time. What are you doing out here? In the heat. Of, of the day and then during this terrible hot weather. And so they, they spill the story. They, Jim Bark is, is a reliable type of a guy. He was well liked by everybody. Everybody 
um, would tell, he's the kind of guy that you would tell a story to. So Riney starts telling this story about Jacob Waltz, his death, the gold that was given to Julia, and said he had a mine, a gold mine in the, in the Superstition Mountains. Well, Jim Bark was a miner, but he was also a prospector. Everybody during the 1800s were miner prospectors, cowboy prospectors, businessmen prospectors, doctors prospectors, if you look back on it. Almost everybody had a sense of looking for treasure or gold. It was the way it was in the West during those days. Well, Jim Bark sets down Riney and talks to him for eight hours, eight hours, and he takes copious notes and he asked him 50 different questions on what have, where you been doing, where you been, what's the clues that were left about the clues. And so he, he asked Riney, then he asked Julia. And so he's trying to confirm between the two of them where they both agree, he figures that's a good clue. When they don't agree, that's not a good clue. Well, in the meantime, on one of their trips out there, Gottfried, the father, he got so disturbed at not being able to find the gold and run around the desert in the heat, he took Julia's handbag, which had Jacob Waltz's notes and the map, and he destroyed, supposedly destroyed the map and the notes by the Dutchman. But Riney and Julia still remember a lot of the notes. So they're giving these to Jim Bark. Julia was sure that they were gonna find the gold, so she did sell everything. And she put everything lock, stock, and barrel into it. Godfrey got, he got angry at Riney because Julia had said, the Dutchman said to Riney, he, she had overheard Jake telling Riney, Riney, you're not paying attention. Riney was only 19. He was a kid, he was a teenager. He said, you're not paying attention. His mind was on girls and drinking and dancing and all that stuff. It wasn't on a maybe something metal in the ground. So Jake says, Riney, you're not paying attention. That mine is hard to find. You must listen. He said it in a clipped accent as they were speaking, they were speaking German. So Jim Bark gets that part of the story also. And Riney didn't pay attention good enough. And Herman hears it also. So Herman is asking Julia, and he's writing his own notes down. So that kind of that after 25 days, so you're in August, you're in September, it's still really hot. Julia and Riney and Gottfried go back to Phoenix, okay? Herman, he is still going to do a little searching on his own. He's got some notes and he's going a little searching. When Julia Thomas was broke and come back from the mountains and not finding the mine or any gold, she started selling maps, maps of the gold mine from what she could remember. And she put in cert certain things on her like the Salt River, like a horse's head, things that Jacob had mentioned, hogs heads and X's for water, et cetera, et cetera. And she would sell these maps from three to seven dollars. Well, that wasn't a bad little thing. Three dollars in those days was what a miner made all day. So working in the mine. So when cowboys only made thirty dollars a month. So she could scrape by. Well, what happens next is the breakup of the group. And and what happened? Julia, she gets disgusted and discouraged. And so she finds another man. She finds a man named Schaefer. Schaefer is a redheaded man. Red hair, red, big red beard. And Julia 
she decides that she is going to become the high priestess of the new Israel. And they changed their name from Shafer to Israel, both of them. And they start a new order or religion. And they're searching for the 144,000 good people that's mentioned in the Bible. That there are 144,000 Israelites somewhere in the world. And if they can find them, that they would be saved. And they also start a temple in downtown Phoenix. And in front of the house, they build this huge fire. The fire is in a type of um, uh, a clay device that they had built in some small clay devices. And they, she's, get, she's then gathering, Julia's gathering people to come to this thing. And she's got believers, believe it or not, she's got believers. Basically, the story goes on and on how that goes. And Julia gets arrested. Oh, oh there's arrest warrants for her for going on the Indian reservation down south and preaching this new religion. She was trespassed, and they asked her not to come back. That's another story for another day. That's Julia's story. Riney, he did some more searching in the mountains. Not a lot, but he did some searches in the interior. He moved to Globe, and he lived in Globe, and he became a caretaker here and there. And at the last uh, job, or so to speak, where he was staying was the ruins, the Indian ruins known as Beshbagawa today. And, and Riney is in a shack living there. And it's 1943, and he's going blind. And knowing he'll never find the Dutchman's gold, and he's really down on himself for going and uh, forgetting to take the proper notes and listening, he puts a shotgun to, in his mouth and he kills himself. That's 1943. So that's Julia. She's gone. Riney's gone. What happened to the old man? Gottfried becomes destitute and maybe a little crazy. He's put in the insane asylum in Phoenix and maybe goes crazy because there was all this gold and he never got to see any of it. They said he was crazy, however, he was a miner and miners in those days played with mercury. They used mercury. And we know that if you get mercury, mercury is one of the causes of Alzheimer's today, supposedly, and dementia. It, it affects you, it gets in the body, it can affect you. And in fact, people working in, in mines, cinnabar mines, been known to have uh, hallucinations. So, so they put him in there for either the mercury or the fact that he actually went crazy, or he was poor. Back in the 1800s, early 1900s, they had no place to put the poor. He was destitute, he couldn't work. They put him in an insane asylum, and there he dies. That leaves one guy, one. That's Herman. And so Herman's story becomes the focus of everybody searching for the lost Dutchman mine. Jake's gone. Julia went with some crazy guy, and they went out west of Phoenix after the fire religion fizzed, and they tried to prospect, and they even filed claims, but that never worked. They're lost in history. Riney goes out to somewhere east of Eden, and he perishes by his own hand. Herman, in the meantime, Herman is in and out of the superstitions, and he finds a job. The job uh, around the turn of the century is working for the Clemens family who had bought the JF Ranch from Jack Frazier and the upper JF, which was known as the Rivas Ranch. So Herman is working at the Rivas and he's working for the Clemens family. During this time, he's working for the Clemens family 
a niece of the Clements comes out. Her name is Pearl Fricker. This is a new bit of information I just developed that I, it's somewhat reliable. So Pearl Fricker's there. there. We have access to her letters. She wrote letters to treasure hunter Ted Cox during the 50s. In 1959, she writes a long letter to Ted Cox, and that's in the notes that I have, that this is the story, my association with Herman Petrash. Herman is befriended by Pearl. How does that occur? Why does it occur? For one thing, the cowboys on the ranch all hate Herman. They think that he knows nothing about nothing. And he also keeps secrets, and he also knows where the Dutchman's mine is, but he won't tell anybody. So they're envious of him. One, they don't like him because he's a foreigner. And two, he keeps the secrets. And he's a quiet guy. And three, you know, he speaks German a lot when these other folks that come out. So he is despised by, he is just treated terribly. And in the early pictures of Herman and the later pictures, you can see that he was beat up pretty bad. His face was really beat up. Actually, Herman was a good looking young man, but his face got all broken and his nose was broken in the later pictures. It looks terrible. He don't give up anything about the, the Dutchman's mind. And matter of fact, Pearl said she became his best friend up there, his only friend up there. Because the Clements owned it, but they actually weren't cowboys up there. Other people worked the ranch for them, the cowboys. They came to visit, et cetera, et cetera, and oversee. But actually, the interaction was between the cowboys and Herman. So Pearl says that Herman, as he got older, promised her some gold. And he promised he would tell her where the mine was. As a matter of fact, uh, he was going to tell her, but he also was hanging on because he knew that anybody couldn't find that mine. It wasn't easy to get to. Well, that's Herman. He, he says he knows where it is. And he says that the mine has a claim on it. That's why he can't file on it already. So. That's that part. Next, we go to um, the story of Mary Bagwell. Now, I talked about Mary Bagwell in the last, in the last uh, story uh, somewhat. Just mentioned her name and some of the clues. Well, Mary Bagwell uh, goes out to interview uh, during, during Herman's last days, it's 1953. Bob Garman had already been there and we went over what Bob Garman said and I'll tell you that again. But Mary Bagwell is interviewing him. She writes a very long newspaper article, or for a journal rather. She writes a, a huge article. And then she tells various things, how Herman found a mine, et cetera, et cetera. The story about Julia and Ryanie and all that. The whole nine yards. How she visited him and his walls are inside his old shack off of U.S. Station Road are pasted with stories about the Lost Dutchman mine. But Herman has never, has never uh, told her where it was or that it existed. So... He's on his last days. He made his deathbed statement to Bob Garman, and she comes along and, and writes this article. And in it, she says, uh, where are the mines? Where's the gold mine? He says, out there. Well, along in this story, even before Herman, and all of them get involved in the story, there's James... Rogers. James Rogers in 1873 or 75 files a claim on Rogers 
ridge, it's called, off Rogers Canyon on the ridges. And he filed several claims. But he has to file them in, this is where the story gets screwed up, because they can't find his paperwork in Pinell County. Well, Rogers filed his claims first in Maricopa County. That's my contention. And then later, after the Silver King mines found, there are mi miners all over the mountains, thousands of them. And so James Rogers files again in Pinell County in 1877. In the meantime, they're taking gold out of one of the mines up there, and he calls it the Silver Chief. And then there are four more Silver Chiefs. Silver Chief one, two, three, four, five, whatever. And other mines that he claimed to have silver, high-grade silver up there. In 1877 also, Aaron Mason, the first superintendent of the Silver King mine, has engineers go to a place uh, coming down off the mountain, and they build a plant to process the gold coming off of the Silver Chief and the other mines up there and processing the gold coming from the Silver King mine. You see, the Silver King mine has a lot of, had a lot of gold in it, but they never discussed it. It was never in any of their official reports. And four people became multimillionaires off of the gold from the Silver King mine. My contention, I put a lot of study into it. And I've got all the old reports from the Silver King mine. Never talk about the gold. But when I was with the Dean family and we were running the mine, the Silver King mine, we were getting gold out of every one. So those old miners knew what gold looked like. So he had a group of them processing the ore coming down from Rogers Ridge and the Silver King mine. So there's gold. There's gold in those mountains in more than one place. And so that, that is another thing that Herman knows. He, because this stuff is in the newspapers. It was constantly in the papers. And Herman, by the way, lived in those mountains for almost 50 years. He never left them. He left them to go to town once in a while. And he, and he sometimes paid with a little bit of gold. Well, he was known to pan Queen Creek and some of the other places to get a little bit of plaster gold, maybe get a little gold dust. Or did he find something in the mountains and didn't want to tell anybody? That's Herman. He's out there. It's 50 years. Garmin, he tells, he says, he says, out there beyond Robles Hills, he said, Herman is saying to Bob Garman, who he'd been friends with, he said, out there beyond the mountains, those hills there are those mountains, and there's Iron Mountain, there's White Mountain. And he says, somewhere out there is the old Jake mine. Now go find it. And Herman dies. He dies. Uh, and there's no, no map, no guidelines, no nothing of what Herman had done. Well, let's go back. Is there a document or there records? All of those years and Godfrey and Ronnie never file a mining claim. Why did they never file a mining claim? So I dig into my notes and I started looking and I looked at the law. The mining law of 1872 says, in order to file a claim and own a mining claim, to own it, you must be a citizen of the United States. When Gottfried came over from Germany with Herman and Reine and a, and a daughter and his wife, old, old Gottfried, he filed a paper to become a citizen. But all he filed was the declaration of interest. And you have to, within five years, then 
prove up your citizenship and actually pay a little fee and get a naturalization document. How do I know this? Both of my grandfathers and grandmothers came over from Europe, from Italy, as a matter of fact, and I have copies of the, my grandfather's naturalization papers. And it's five years after they came here. So that was the law then. You could not own certain things. You could not vote. And you had to be a citizen. Herman and Riney did not know this. They thought when they come over, their father filed naturalization paper, but it was only declaration of intent. So all the time they were mining and looking for, looking for mines, they couldn't file. They could not file a claim on one if they wanted to. So in 1892, after this botched search for the Dutchman's mine, Reine goes one way, Julia goes another, and Herman leaves town. Herman's gone for a while. And he comes back in 1897. And what the first thing he does, he goes up on Rogers Ridge and he gets Jim Bark to sign a mining claim and put his name on it. So he, him and Riney would then be partners with Jim Bark. Now they could be partners in a mine, but they could not own the mining claim. And where was it? It was just on the other side of the place where high grade gold came out in the 1870s and 1880s. That place being the Silver Chief Mine and some of the other mines. So he filed a mining claim and that gave him a reason and then, of course, he went to work for the Clemens family, which around 1900 took over the uh, Upper Rivas. So he had a reason then to be snooping around the mountains. Uh, that, now, that mine was protected. In those days, people knew that there was gold to be had out of there. The major mining shut down at that mine in 1883 after because there was a major flood and it flooded all of the shaft mines up in the mountain so they didn't have the equipment to pump out the mines etc nor did james rogers he didn't have the money so he sold the mining claim his claims on rogers ridge to a fellow named jd raymer judge raymer in 1886 Judge Raymer held those mining claims until 1896. Therefore, Herman knew he couldn't file on any of those claims until he had proved that there, there was nobody that owned them, no ownership. Well, he had to file, uh, he filed that mining claim on 1897. And he may have, in fact, took some gold out of the, uh, the old um, Silver Chief mine or one of the other mines up there that had gold, of which there were about 10. And, and uh, Herm, uh, Herman was right. There were about 10 old mines up there that contained gold, as, it, as I find out later in the future, and we'll go to that story. But... He does not file any mining claims because that mine is still protected in 1896. Those mines are still protected. And besides, Herman didn't have any money to do any startup of mining there, any major mining. He was literally living hand to mop. So that, that's Herman's story. The fact is, the Mining Act of 1872 said you got to be a citizen, a citizen to own a mining claim. So, so neither Gottfried, nor Herman, nor Briney 
could file a mining claim up there. And we know what happened to them. Julia, because her husband, Emil Thomas, became a U.S. citizen, she had, a, she had the authority to file a mining claim. But she was gone. She went her way. And that, that's getting pretty tough now to sort this out. Who did what and when and why? Kind of sum this up. They knew gold was out there. A lot of people were searching. Nobody had the clues. The clues were destroyed by the, the best clues written by the Dutchman himself were destroyed by Godfrey. Riney didn't pay enough attention. Jim Bark, Jim Bark questioned Riney at length for eight hours and wrote down what, what Julia and him agreed on. And then Jim Bark searched for the mine. He set people out there searching for the mine. Some people have claimed to have found a mine. Joe Deering claimed to have found it around 1884. He died in a mine collapse at the Silver King. There was another guy that said he found it around 1884, and he met the Dutchman out there. And the Dutchman says, get off this land or I will kill you. You don't come back to this mine. Well, he went up north and round, up around a place called Round Mesa, and he was digging a well for a ranch, and the well collapsed in on him. He told, us, he told the people up there, the cowboys, he would give them all the wealth they want in the world. He knows where the mine, a rich gold mine is. If they dig them out, they couldn't. He was digging, he was digging in quicksand. It collapsed on him. They couldn't get him out alive. And he's buried there. And his name is in the stories. Two soldiers said they found the mine. It came to Silver King. And they actually had gold. But they were murdered. They were, we went out in search of it. And both of them were murdered in the mountains in 1883. 1883, there was the Great Flood. Mining was shut down on Rogers Ridge. Not a lot of people were going up there. Not a people knew about what was going up on up there. A whole new generation of people come. They all they know is rumors, and that's what transpired for ah uh, until the time of 1931. Everything was rumors. 31, we know the Dr. Ruth saga comes into play, and beyond that. <clears throat> then after Ruth, there becomes the 40s and 50s. The people come out of the war. Guys shell-shocked. And guys without jobs, they come to Arizona. They say there's gold out there. But they don't find it. They don't find the Dutchman's mine, that's for sure. All of this is just speculation beyond that. And the writers at that time of the 50s and 60s, they say the gold is that weaver's needle because the Dutchman in his story mentioned, he said, if you climb to the peak up over the mountain, he said, you look out to the south, you'll see a spire, a rock spire or pointed peak. If you look out there, you won't see weaver's needle to the south. It's to the west. But there is a rock spire out there. And there is a saddle where the Dutchman said he found, he hid his tools. And there is a cave, and there is a mine that had high gray gold. And if you look to the west, what do you see? Weaver's needle to the west. And so all these stories come out in the 60s and 70s, and they say Weaver's needle is the source. All this fraudulent, false information. There's no gold at Weaver's needle. Two scientists, two engineers, went there for six months, searched all the washes coming from Weaver's Needle, and did not find gold. Now, the name is a little difficult for me to understand and, and uh, pronounce, but his first name was Yu, and he had a French last name. It's hard for me to pronounce. And, and he wrote a book called West of Dawn. And in there, he said his search in the Superstition Mountains and in Weaver's Needle, 
No gold was ever found. As a matter of fact, he wrote to two prospectors in the 1960s who came to Arizona to search, and he said, don't go to Weaver's Needle, because <laughs> they asked him about it. And he said, there's no gold there, no gold. But uh, recently I told a story about a shootout at Weaver's Needle, and they were fighting over something that wasn't even there. No gold was ever found at Weaver's Needle. What was the final best clue? It was actually given by Herman. He said, out there past the Robles Hills, there's Iron Mountain and White Mountain. And there's 10 old Spanish mines that I know of out there. And the old Jake mine is out there. Now go find it. We'll continue this saga and this mystery of what happened, where is or where was the Lost Dutchman Mine? This has been one of the mysterious stories of Superstition Mountains. Thank you for watching this episode of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains.